G'day guys, welcome to the next installment of the Woodford Sports Science Consulting Podcast. I am Christian Woodford and today I've got a very special guest with me, Matt Howley from the University of Notre Dame all the way in the from the US of A. Matt, welcome. Thanks mate, good to be here, good to have a chat. Beautiful. Now Matt, just explain to all the viewers out there, as, I, as I've told you and I've told all the viewers out there, I've actually set this up so one, we can expose Australian talent kind of like Mike Boyle does his podcast and he exposes all the American talent and everyone knows about these guys. In Australia, we've got some great talented strength conditioning coaches, but because strength and conditioning isn't as well developed in Australia, we most people don't know about you guys. So you just want to give a little bit of background about yourself, what's your educational background for all the viewers out there because we do have a lot of sports science students who watch this. Um, so a little bit of background about your education, but also – what you're doing at Notre Dame University, what your official title is, and just your background in coaching. Yep. Um, so basically, I was Deakin Sports Science graduate, so went through their course, finished there in 2009. Um, during that time, got some experience working the Eastern Ranges in the TAC Cup. Um, started off as an assist, like just someone a lackey running around just doing all the small little jobs, throwing water bottles, all the stupid things you have to I, start doing. I know that. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then progressed up, became high performance manager there, um, undertook masters at Edith Cowan, so the online masters degree they have there. Yeah. Um, did that, that kind of stuff. And then in the middle of it, always had a wanted to work overseas is probably a good way to put it. So investigated the internships over here. A lot of people said, oh, it's worthwhile. So saved up the money that you need to come over. So like yourself did and, $7,000 later, um, was over here for three months, uh, position opened up, interviewed, didn't get the first one, flew back home, two weeks later they ring me and they're like, hey, we've got a position, so um, assistant strength and conditioning coach, uh, men's soccer, rowing, men's and women's golf, and then was at home, visa process, took about five months, uh, worked at Hawthorne, or assisted at Hawthorne um, for the six, seven months I was home, as well as continuing my job at Eastern Rangers. And then I've been back here now, um, uh, 33 months I've been here, so nearly three years, three years in November. Yeah. And uh, assistant strength and conditioning coach. And along that path, we're now making a big push into sports science. So I'm receiving an Australian background, a strong sports science background. I'm trying to help develop a sports science initiative here in the sports science department, is probably a good way to put it. Okay, awesome, awesome. I mean, similar to yourself, I mean, you and I are kind of, I mean, I, I've known about you for a while now, probably three years since you started over there and we're kind of, I mean, when I went to Maryland, I heard about your story and obviously we've kind of got similar stories like yourself, myself and Hampo, all three of us kind of Australian strength coaches all went overseas and we saw something, you know, as you know, it's just an incredible system. Most people talk to me about and ask me what the system's like. I mean, like you, I had to, I save, I think it was 15 grand all up to go over there and I paid for my own education, which most people really don't want to do and I did it myself like yourself. Can you just yep. explain all the viewers out there, just the main difference, I mean, I've explained it before, my main difference is that I thought being very outspoken about it, but what do you think the main difference is, is in terms of Australia and America in terms of strength conditioning for not only the athletes, but also aspiring strength conditioning coaches? What, what do you think? Well, if you start off with aspiring coaches, there's so many more jobs over here. The collegiate system offers so many more jobs, and that's yep. the, the best thing. Whether it's internships, graduate assistantships, assistance positions, or head or director kind of job, yeah. um, there's so many more positions available. Well, obviously, there's 330 Division One colleges now. They all don't have seven Olympic staff and four football staff like we have here, being one of the bigger universities. But there's so many more jobs available. Yeah. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing is like, like they're producing the students, um, but they're also able to people are able to get jobs. It, it is still very scarce over here with the relative population, but. That's really the biggest thing from a work point of view. Um, but then to go on the other side, the biggest difference that I see is at home, everyone's so focused on the conditioning side, the running side. They, yeah. they term conditioning as running at home. Where over here, there's like, and the focus is more strength power based um, yeah. in general. Um, but I think the people that really know what they're doing find that place in the middle. Um, where, okay, so you understand running conditioning, but it's not doing long, slow distance, as you always speak about. Mm. It's about doing intermittent and interval kind of work is probably the, the easiest way to term it for the people that are listening. And then also complementing that with a good quality strength training program. What, in terms of, I mean, when I went over there and I, I saw the athletes, do you think it's a cultural thing? Because for me, 
I mean, is it because our sport, and I always ask every different coach from America, I always ask them the same question, especially if they're an Australian coach they've got from Australia to America, is it a cultural thing where Americans just been brought, brought up to understand strength, power, speed, agility, neuromuscular development compared to our Australian kids, as you know, because you're coming from a football background in the Eastern Ranges, and we're told to run for performance, as I always say, long, slow distance running. What, what do you think? Is it a cultural thing? It's a cultural thing, but I think it all stems from what, if you want to term the number one sports are. So obviously AFL is our number one sport, which is a give or take. It's an aerobic based game. Yes, it's aerobic power. Yeah. There's a lot of power and strength involved, and we know that. Mm. But like in general, people term it an aerobic game. Where over here, you look at football, you look at baseball, even basketball, they're all power based sports. So mm -hmm. if you want to get better at those sports, or if you want to play American football, you need to have, be strength, power, conditioning, or aerobic conditioning plays a very minor role in that sport. Yeah. You obviously need to condition other systems. So I think that's what it is, is the culture of the sport determines the culture of the industry. And the leading sport over here, give or take, is American football. That's the one that most kids want to try and play. Um, and that one, it's AFL. So I think it's the, the sport determines like the culture a little bit. I mean, when I went over there, I don't know about you, but I was absolutely astounded by the facilities. I mean, for, for these guys, a student athlete, as you Obviously, you coach yeah. student athletes over there. I could not get over the facilities in terms of Olympic lifting platforms, squat racks, barbells, the essential equipment for athletic development. For me, I was quite overwhelmed. I mean, where I went, I mean, your, your school not sounds quite a big school like Maryland. What, what I saw was unbelievable. I mean, just explain to all, all the viewers out there how you felt when you first walked an Australian kid, not really knowing. I mean, I know you followed American sport. I didn't. Um, how did you feel when you first walked into the, uh, the weights room and you saw the facilities? Take, go back to the first day. How, how did you feel about it? Like, you, you're pretty in awe of what you have here. Yeah. Like, I still walk in every day and I'm like, oh, I'm just at work now. It's like, it's nothing different. Yeah. But then like, I have mates come and visit, family come and visit. And they're like, this is ridiculous what you have access to. And I'm like, yeah, I just sort of take it for granted now. So like, yeah. where I'm housed, I'm in our football weight room here is where my office is. And it's 25,000 square feet. Um, weight room size so it's it's huge so we've got on one side of the weight room we have a 50 yard by 25 yard field turf area yeah. and then on the other side of the weight then we have some pillars through the middle which uh, takes up about a quarter of the room to obviously hold the building up and then on the other side in a 50 by 25 meter area we have light weights so there's not many machines in there there's a couple of machines a few pull downs and things like that but you got like same as what you guys have at WSSC yeah. we have boot hams Plenty of Olympic lifting platforms. We have 10 platforms. We have 10 bench press stations. We have 10 squat racks. Um, dumbbells that go from five pounds up to 150 pounds, two sets of those. Mm. Um, so we've got plenty of equipment. And that's obviously this weight room. Then obviously here being a big school, we also have two satellite weight rooms. So we have one in our hockey facility where we have 12 um, combination Olympic lifting platform squat rack stations. And then we have six in our basketball stadium as well. So we've got three facilities we can train our student athletes in so like on campus we have what's that somewhere like 32 olympic lifting platforms uh, uh, the heat. i mean it's always interesting when i came back i mean for me i was overawed the first day i walked in and then after three months of being there as you said you kind of get used to it i mean i was used yep. to linemen squatting deadlifting cleaning massive numbers for me i got used to it i, I kind of like you get used to training guys who just lift big move yep. quick, just the athletic. And you go back to Australia, and the, the thing that I found was when I opened WSSC, people couldn't understand what I was doing it for because they don't understand the role of a performance coach. Now, correct, yep. me, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I went to Maryland, I went out and I told people I'm a strength conditioning coach, and the general public knew what I did. You go to yep. Australia, and really no one understands what our role is. And for me, it's like education, as, I, as I've always said to you. How have you found that difference over there? Like, do people over there, the general population, do they actually know what you do? Yeah. Like, people, like, our head football strength coach, people know who he is. Okay. Like, like that's, like, people know who those guys are. Like, everyone's heard of Scott Cochran, who works Scott at Alabama. Scott Cochran, like, Alabama, yeah. Famous, so you see some of his famous videos that are out there. Like, people know these guys. Like, these guys get airtime on SportsCenter on ESPN. Like, this is crazy. Like, so during... Um, the draft um, or the recruiting, national recruiting day they have, they did a five-minute segment in our weight room with our strength coach coaching two of our guys through um, movements on our elite form system that we just got put into, one, promote elite form, and two, to promote our, our program. Like, like they, they, they spend time with the head coach, but they also spend time with the head strength edition coach. Like, it's very rare 
apart from probably Burgess at home now, that, that someone in that kind of position that's getting airtime, like in the public eye, yes, yeah, some guys don't want it, but it's important for our like our industry to build a profile of everyone, not just building it of yourself. I mean, I, I think that I think the biggest thing that I found was in terms of the private sector, especially in Australia, no one really knows what the fuck we do. No one really knows about it. And then when I came back, I said to myself, and you, you understand this because you are, you're in America, so you'd understand guys like Cressy, Boyle, Tate, DeFranco, my idol DeFranco, you know how I am with yeah, DeFranco. I mean, these guys are yeah. unbelievable. Because what they do is they put applied sports science, strength conditioning, performance coaches, they, they, put them, they put them in mainstream media. And then more people know what we do, more jobs open up, the general public know what we do, and we develop applied sports science in Australia. At the moment, it wasn't developed. When I came back, there was no one. So these kids like yourself in exercise science, who you tell me, who, who do we have to look up to in exercise science to give, up, give us light at the end of the tunnel for jobs? Who do we have? But if, but the, in the public, if you're not talking professional sport, there's essentially no one. Well, there we go. So, you, I mean, you answered their own question. So for me, I came back and I said, I wanted to give these kids hope to say, okay, in the private sector, we, let's not, let's forget about the elite sector. Let's talk about the private sector. Because you know better than anyone, there's only minimal, and you, you saw my last podcast with Terry, there's only minimal jobs available in elite sports. So where are these kids going? I mean, and I, you and I had this discussion before. All these kids are doing these masters of high performance sport, masters of sports science, but there's no jobs out there in Australia. So what, as I've told you, what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop more jobs. And that's one thing about the American system, which you could tell the viewers more about, is just the fact that how many people really know about strength conditioning and how many jobs are opened up. I mean, what advice do you have for any exercise science students, especially the Australian kids, about going to America? What do you think the best way of doing it is? Like you, you, do, you need to get into a college environment. There's, there, it's like it's somewhat working like an institute. Yeah. There's obviously some, di- some differences because of the school requirements and um, the like that you're working. Like I have five different head coaches I work under, so every coach, every team, you got to have a different personality potentially with. Yeah. Um, and the way like my the way I do things is very similar. I don't change team to team all that much. But if you've got different head coaches with different requirements, you need to have a different personality. So you get to play the role of working with five different teams at once and working under a coach, um, which is important that then you've got to develop those skills of communication and getting what you need in a program, but also what the coach needs for the team to be successful. And then all the other things that go in a strength conditioning program. So it's important that you develop those skills, but over here, you need to get into a college environment. You need to do an internship. Yes, it costs you money, but like the best professional development you get is always the stuff you pay for. You never get any good development for free. Yeah. Like that's the, that's the hardest thing that people don't want to spend any money. So like, I've got no money, I don't want to spend it. But sometimes, like you can vouch this, you got to spend money, to make money. going to debt kind of thing, yeah. and then then come out of the hole. And then once you get through that, you're bigger and better for it. And like you, Hampo, I, like all the guys that we know of that have come over here, are all benefiting from the money we outlay to to get over in the first place. And, that, and that's the biggest thing. Like, it's going to cost you something if you want to get somewhere, but if you're really passionate about it, you've got to go down that path. I mean, in terms of um, what what I did, if you just want to explain to all the viewers out there, I mean, it's a long process. And I mean, I don't know about you. I'm pretty sure you didn't have any networks, but I had no networks before I, I went on this journey. If you just want to explain how you did it, I get this question at least, I reckon, probably about 20 times <laughs> a month, how I did it. Everyone's like, oh, okay. can I have your contacts? Can I have your contacts? For all the viewers out there, yeah. I had no contacts. All I did was, and Matt's going to tell you the same way he did it, I literally yeah. emailed every single school and literally, I mean, I just kept in contact with every school and I, I pretty much annoyed the hell out of them until I got an internship yeah. and I took, no, I did not take no, no I, I just kept going. If they said no, I kept going with it. So if you want to explain to them you need fortitude to keep doing it, just explain how you best did it. So basically, same way as you did. I logged on the NSCA website. <laughs> Clicked on the college Where's link and it gives you the link of every school. And then you start at the top, you click on yep. it, you see my thing was I had a little spreadsheet set yep. up and do they have do they offer an internship program where they have a guided program or they have a like an advertisement out there, tick across. Then do they um like who's the head strength coach? Write the email down, who's the uh, the associate or the assistant, chuck their email down. And if there was programs that had like advertisements out there straight away email them just on the by apply for the job basically and that's what you got to do you just got to apply everywhere um and then went through and then started 
speaking to people, found a couple of different websites where they're all where other people list them on. If they don't want to list them on their own school website, start applying and then or basically asking or the people who didn't have them ask them, do you offer them? And every school offers them. They all just don't advertise them basically. Yeah. And then on one website, there was probably 20 one day, and I'm like, all right, here we go, start the trend. So CV ready, resume ready, edited them up as we went, sent them off to every school, um, got got replies from six of them overnight, basically. But but most schools are pretty good within a few days getting back to you. Um, then spoke to a couple, a couple were turned off because I was from overseas, fair enough. Um, then spoke to UC Santa Barbara and here, um, basically had a phone with me the next night with um, my now associate director here, Elisa, and um, two days later I, I was offered an internship. Jesus. And so you just gotta like you just gotta apply and like well, I probably didn't have to push as hard as you, but you just gotta apply at the people like the CSCCA website um, is a good place to look. The NSCA website, people will list them on there, and there's always internships listed. Like some people will need you doing them for credit, like we require here, but then there's others that'll just take any Joe essentially off the street that's got a like that's got a degree in that area so like you just got to look on the internet like yeah it takes some time and it's boring hours but if you don't put the boring hours in you don't get the successful hours in the other end. I mean I always say to people who ask me in terms of strength conditioning I mean you're kind of different where you're in the collegiate system or I like to call the elites elite system in Australia as you know the performance industry isn't well developed so for me a lot of people ask me how is the best way to make it? and you can tell because you're from the American system like myself, it's and you understand it, they call it embracing the grind. So we call it grinding, as you know, yeah. and they grind it out. And yeah. people say to me, how is the best way to make in the American system? And you can vouch for this. It's just work ethic, isn't it? It's just putting in the hours, yeah. rolling up your sleeves, getting in there and coaching. Yeah, like, like my internship, 5.30 in the morning till 7.30 at night. And you're probably the same. You may be a bit longer. I was, I was worse. Oh. I was 6 a.m. till 9 p.m. Monday to Friday. Yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's you've just got to get in and do it, and then like like Australian kids are well educated, and because I had coaching experience, like when I was here, like you've just got to go in and do it. You can't sit back and go, oh well, they may ask me to do something. You've just got to go and do, and that's what I did. And within two weeks, like I was asked to write a training program for one of the teams, like to see what I could then do on the writing side of things, and then it's just about like stepping up to the plate. Every time they throw your bone, you got to like go and chase it down and get it kind of thing and like that's what I did and then like build up really good relationships with all the staff and spoke to coaches spoke to athletes and you got to communicate well do all those things really good and then like you'll soon get a lot of respect from the people that you're working with. Go, going back to your previous point you said when they give you a bone you got to kind of go with it I'll just give you one of my experiences I remember the third week as you know and this is all for all the viewers out there what happens in the collegiate system, a lot of NFL players in their off-season actually go to their previous colleges and train. I was lucky enough, third week in, a guy called Donald Brown, who's from the Indianapolis Colts. I don't know where he is now, but because I don't really follow NFL. The third week came down and Drew Wilson, who was the, the head strength coach at Maryland, he still is at the moment, he actually said to me, he said, I want you to take Donald through speed. So like what Matt said, I was some Australian kid in my third week and I'm he's throwing me this this chance to coach this NFL player, and I couldn't believe it. So third week in, I had a crack at it. I don't think, obviously, you, you never know if you're ready. You just got to kind of throw yourself into it and not be worried if yep. you are going to stuff up and just give it a crack. And what Matt said, don't go there being scared. Go there, have an absolute dip at it and immerse yourself in the cult culture. And the biggest difference that I, have, I find between Australian students and American students is American students are a lot more hands-on, a lot more practical. The Australian students are yep. a lot more sports science-based. And one thing to all the viewers out there and the Australian kids, sports science, in my opinion, will not get you jobs. It's the coaching aspect which will get you the jobs. It's applied strength conditioning. Now, I don't know what you think, Matt. I mean, that's just my opinion on it. What, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that's 100% right. Like, you just got to back yourself, like, going back to what you said. But, like, for me, like, I obviously understand the weight room and, like, conditioning and all the other aspects that go into it. But, like, as I said earlier, like, we're trying to, develop a path into sports science here. So like we've got some of our catapult units sitting behind us here and we've got some force plates and some other technology that not many other people can afford. And like I'm 
now trying to take that path. But if you, as you say, well, I like calling it applied sports science, but when I call, I don't call the weight room applied sports science, I refer to that as strength and conditioning but, or strength training. But when we're talking this stuff, like the technologies and things, that's applying it because you need to be able to disseminate data, understand it, but then be able to coach the athlete and coach the coach and make them understand what you're talking about. Because you can have hundreds of pieces of data, but if you can't then articulate that and make it useful and apply it, then you're useless is the way I look at it. So I think you need to be able to like disseminate data, use it, but then you need to be able to apply it. And then, okay, this is telling me this. So what do I need to do? Conditioning, weight room, speed, agility, all that kind of stuff to make the athlete better. I mean, I think you bring a fair point. It's very important, obviously, as strength coaches, we need, I call it having a holistic balance, being balanced as a strength coach. So yep. understand your way around the weight room, understand strength, understand power development, understand speed, agility, conditioning, understand sprinting mechanics. That's really important in terms of the practical side, but in terms of objective quantitative data, it's obviously very important to to get that data, but understand how to dissociate what do we need, what don't we need, and then educate the athlete and the coach, which is really important, which brings me to probably my next question. One thing I saw in America is they're very hands-on, very practically applied. They know, they know their way around the weight room. They know how to program. They're very good at that. One thing that I saw lacking was the lack of training load monitoring or the lack of any sports science whatsoever kind of what you brought up with the GPS units, which you've got. Is that a common, uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm, what I've been told, it's a pretty common thing not to have much sports science in the collegiate system. Tell me what you know about it and what, what you think about it. I would say sports science is, or it was not existent when I arrived over here in any setting, whether you're talking professional or collegiate. So NFL, NBA, all those things. It's now growing. Like with companies like Catapult, they moved over or they started bringing, getting into the market over here when I came over, obviously being a Melbourne-based company. Um, and we've been liaising with them. Now, we've had units with them for two years, mainly women's soccer have used them. But now my men's soccer team are using them. Lacrosse will start using them. But that's one. It's only one tool in the toolbox, though. So good for a running-based team sport. But, like, you look at these other, like, just well-being and wellness monitoring systems, which I know you guys yeah. use. Like, they're not existent here. And, like, the way I look at this, like, the way I scale strength and conditioning coaches is if you have your strength coach, and that's all he does is in the weight room, he's a level one guy. Then your level two guy is someone that can write a conditioning program that's, that complements your strength training. Then your level three guy is someone that can then monitor that using different approaches, and then the, the process goes up level four, level five. But over here, there's so many people that only are level one and level two. No one knows how to monitor, assess, and reprogram their athletes. And that's something that they're getting better at, and they're starting to ask people from Australia, from England, who have versed backgrounds in this area. And like there's some guys over here... Like where Hampo works at the Jags, they're doing some really good stuff. Kentucky football, um, are pretty renowned for doing stuff. Florida State won the championship last year, doing some good sports science things. The Eagles in the NFL are doing some great stuff. So people are now embracing this, and which is creating more jobs. And the thing with the thing with this is, there's not many people that know it over here. So if you're a sports scientist or more down that path, there still is an area for you over here. Like I've just advertised for an intern that's basically going to be my sports science intern that we're looking to get an intern for a sports science. So they'll be like a strength and conditioning one, probably seven till seven they'll work because of the, the hours that'll be required. But that's the path that it's going. There is jobs now becoming in both areas. So if you're a strength and conditioning guy, good, there's plenty of internships. But if you're a sports science person as well, America still could be a path. I mean, it, it is a massive thing. I mean, that's one thing that I noticed was just the lack of even wellness scales, RPEs. They didn't do anything like that. There was no... There's no monitoring, no athlete monitoring. What I couldn't get over it because there's 60 athletes, seven, whatever, in the football program, how many athletes there are, and there really wasn't much monitoring. I'm like, look, I, that's how they run their program because it's a cultural thing. As you said, it's yep. kind of starting to change now, which is a big thing, and I, I think that's only going to improve their performance in the long term. And as you said, offer up more jobs. So it's obviously great to hear that more sports science is actually coming into the American system. And I think I think that where what they've always been is because they're so talented genetically over mm. here, and you see so many teams over here, they always talk about next man in. But whether it's the best guy or the fifteenth guy, if you get him injured, we've got another guy that can replace him, no problem. That's always been the mentality where teams are now starting to see the value in keeping their best players on the yeah. path. And the way you do that is through monitoring and through sports science. Strength and conditioning necessarily doesn't keep them on the yeah. path. It helps build a better product, but the sports science helps keep the guys on the path in that facet. And I think that's what people are now understand. In, in terms of, I mean, the Australian system, in terms of what my, the WSSC product and what we've developed, 
what do, what do you think of what we've done in terms of opening up more jobs, creating more awareness about strength and conditioning? But obviously, you've kind of seen it from afar. You've known me for three years now. What do you think about where strength and conditioning in Australia is going in both the elite and the private sectors? Well, I think what you're doing is great. Like, we need more of it. Um, but the general public, like, you either have one facility that you have or you have 100 fitness firsts going around. And you go to fitness first, you're on a machine, and you have Joe out of the eight-week degree that's taking you through. Like, you don't have someone that's well-versed in all these kind of sports science areas and got good background knowledge and able to apply it. And I think the biggest thing is the public don't understand that the methods that work best and like as you talk about ground-based power, ground-based strength, all those kind of things, that's the best way to get development. And people go, oh, I want to trim down. I want to lean out. Well, what do you want to look like? And most people will go, oh, I want to look like him. And nine times out of ten, it's an athlete. So if you want to look like an athlete, you probably got to train like one. That's, that's my theory on it. And training like one means you need to squat. You probably need a deadlift. You probably need to do upper body push pull. You need to do some power work. You need to do speed. You need to do some good quality conditioning work. And but uh, that's exactly what you guys do down there. And I think so many people don't understand that. They see it going, as you always say, going for long, slow distance run and doing high rep, like low weight strength training. It doesn't work. Mm. What, in terms of, I mean, for WSSC, the whole the whole idea was to create more jobs. I mean, what what you've seen over there, um, what, it, what advice can you give for any kids out? I mean, I know you're not in the private sector, but what advice can you give to the kids out there, all these exercise science guys? Because I get, as, you, as I've told you before, I get a thousand emails about jobs. What are best advice can you give to these kids who might not get a job in elite sport early on but want to develop? What advice can you give them for just the Australian kids who want to stay here? You've just got to persist. Um, like the other option is, is where if you're training the population or your athletes or your group of people that you're training, you need to train them based on these things. So you go to a fitness first, there's still a squat rack there, there's still free weights and all that kind of stuff. So it's about applying that knowledge and training them generally. So even if you are a personal trainer, it's still training your clients like you're trying to get this kind of development out of them. You can't then just try and chop and change and you need to speak to people, you need to network well, and you just got to keep volunteering your time. Like That's the biggest thing that I think people struggle with is how much volunteer goes into it. But you've got to volunteer your time. Like it may be the fact that you're not volunteering just at one place, you need to put in three hours here one night, four hours there another night, like go to a TSC Cup team, spend one night a week there. Maybe they can get what, one afternoon a week with you or something like that. But it's about just spreading out, networking. At some point, there will be jobs start to open up and hopefully there is more facilities like yours which can help that at some point. Down just, just going back to the previous point about just um, volunteering your time, just let everyone know out there, and Matt, I'm sure you can expose your experience on it, I actually did, and myself, and most of my staff, I know Jay Ellis has done it as well, and a few others. you got to remember, in this industry, if you're in it for the money, you're in it for wrong reasons. As Matty can say, I mean, you literally <laughs> make, I mean, for, for me, I volunteered for seven years, building up my networks, building yeah. up my experiences, getting that applied coaching experience. All the viewers out there, all yeah. the kids out there doing exercise science, just let everyone know, it's a slog. There's no set career path. What my company's trying to do is create a career path, so there are more jobs opening up. So that's why we're asking everyone to get behind what we do because we're only going to open up more jobs, and that's what we want to do. But as Maddie can, I'm sure, is about to explain, I mean, I did so much free work experience, and even at the end of it, you might not come out with a job, so you kind of got to stick out. I know one of my mates, and I know you know him as well, Matty Woolnart, which is a great story. He did the same thing like Hampo, like Matt, like my mate Matt Hibbert in the, from the Western Bulldogs. It's literally just grinding it out. And you might not be lucky. As Maddie said, right place, right time. But for me, it was always making about networks. The reason why Woodford SSC has done so well is one, because I explain and justify everything with the science. But two, because I network with coaches, with other strength conditioning coaches, and we expand the brand. That's what we're trying to do. So if you just want to explain how much free work you actually did to get to this point and let, explain to the viewers how you did it. Yeah, like well, free work, like well, it's, it's just something that's part and parcel of the sports industry, not just the strength and conditioning industry. I think it's the best place to start. Like, if you want to be involved in sport, you've got to be willing to do it for the love, not for the money. There's just no money in sport. As much as these athletes are getting paid, there's no money in sport. So you've got to do it for the love. Then for volunteering, um, like, yeah, I started, my Eastern Rangers stuff was all voluntary. So I was there, but almost one year, I was spending 30 hours a week there getting a stipend of a couple of hundred dollars a month, basically petrol money. 
which which doesn't count as getting paid at that point. Then time at Hawthorne unpaid, time at Melbourne Storm under 20 is unpaid, time over here like completely unpaid and had to pay my way to come over here. Um, and then spent time doing a couple of other little things on the side. But I was in it for four and a half years, totally unpaid. And like my first start was through a lecturer because he worked at the Eastern Rangers and was running the program there. So again, another right place, right time scenario. But it's about networking and like right place, right time and having some luck. Like if you don't have luck pull your way, you're not going to get the right breaks. You've just got to make sure when you get the opportunity, you take it with both hands. In terms of, I mean... I, most of the viewers out there know, understand my methods and what, in terms of Woodford SSC training systems and what, what I believe in. I mean, I'm a big believer in not reinventing the wheel in terms of athlete development. I think, and you, you, every time I write up a post, it's always good to see. You know, I, and that's one thing I really do appreciate guys like yourself who is in elite sport, guys like Hampo, guys like Matt Hibbert, as you're making Matt Hibbert as well, guys like Luke Mackey, guys like Keegan Smith, all these guys, are super opposite, all these coaches in elite sport who's really got behind my brand in the private sector, I'm a, I'm a massive believer in not reinventing the wheel. What what has worked, you don't want to reinvent it. And I've always said this, you can have 10 different coaches and all had subtle differences in the pro, in their programming, but the core principles always stay the same. So in terms of compound, multi-joint, multi-planet, ground-based movements, training in kinetic chain, posterior chain development, intention to move the weight quick, quickly, and central nervous system development. I mean, I'm a big believer in just basic methodology progression for athletes. What is your take on athletic development? And I know for a fact you're very simplistic like me. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. I keep everything simple. That's probably my biggest complaint I get from my athletes here, or my student athletes, is why are we doing this again? We did, like, we've done this for ages. And I'm like, that's because you're not very good at it anyway, and we need to get better at it because it's important for your development moving forward. And like, you get that question all the time. Like, my rowers will deadlift every week they're here. And some people look at that and like, that's stupid. Like, we'll change up the type of deadlift like you do, but we're going to pull from the floor every week they're here. We're going to do some form of squat every week they're here. And that's just the way it works. Like, you need to develop the basic movements. And my issue in this setting is we have them for eight weeks, they get a week off. We have them for another eight to ten weeks, they get four weeks off. Then they come back and it's the same system. Then they leave over summer and they're gone for two to three months. So the issue then is they come back, you don't, they get, they're in off-season, some of these teams. They don't train. So they come back, and you've got to recondition the athlete again. So you basically got to start the wheel at the same place, maybe with a 5% buffer on top of it each year. So it makes it real hard. Um, and that's nothing against the, the athletes. They're obviously away. They, they need time off and all that kind of thing as well. But the kids that stay here over summer or do all the work when they're away, you see their development, how much it progresses so much more quickly than the kids that don't train on a consistent basis. And... You've just got to keep it simple. Like the, as you always say, the simple stuff is the stuff that works, and you just you don't need to reinvent it. You just got to do like basic sets and reps. You don't need to do anything fancy. Just core based movements, good accessories uh, for injury prevention kind of stuff, and that's the that's sort of my approach. And as I say, like my program is pretty pretty plain, yet we get some pretty good results. One in the weight room, and it's transferring to some good results. On I mean, the one thing well. I use with most of my athletes, and uh, that my athletes can vouch for this, is I always say, and that, and we get a lot, you know, our programs are simplistic, but don't take simplistic for easy. I mean, you can make, make an exercise harder by two yeah. ways. Either lift heavier weight at quicker movement speed. And I always say, example, I've had two athletes come up to me with the same program. And one athlete once said to me, oh, him and I are on the same program. They said, I, I'm more advanced than him. And I said, well, what do you, want? do you want? Do you want me to entertain you or do you want results? And what I said was, you should be lifting heavier weights at quicker movement speed to great, make, create greater task complexity and make the exercise harder. And the simple things work. I mean, for me, my athletes, and I'm sure your athletes, are always going to do explosive movement. They're either going to do a bilateral, either quad, either a squat or a hip dominant or a deadlift. They might chuck in some upper body push-pull, be it horizontal or vertical. They're going to do a unilateral uh, leg movement, and they're going to chuck in a core movement. And within that program, we're going to teach them to sprint, accelerate, de-accelerate, jump, land, and change direction. And this is the basis, in, in my opinion, uh, athletic development, which will yield really strong transfer to the athletic environment. But also, once again, then you need to be able to monitor your athletes to maximize adaptation. And that's the way I've always thought with athletic development. I think, in my opinion, I think the American system's unbelievable. And I'm, as you know, I'm a massive believer in it. I mean, both of us are very lucky to be exposed to, especially Australian kids that we are. Um, and it, for me, it was an unbelievable experience. In terms of pretty much the last question I've got for you, and ask Terry this as well. 
where do you see yourself in the next five, ten years? Where do, Matt Haley, where do you see yourself in the next five, ten years? It, it all depends on opportunity, I would say. Um, the, like the hardest thing is, is because I've got such a well-versed sports science background is at some point I'm moving in that direction probably over here. Like at, at some point, and as much as we say there's no money in sport, there's a little bit of money. So if the money's yeah. there, you got to take it. So not that I want to leave weight room coaching um, because I do enjoy it, but at some point um, with my skills I have with some of these technologies, probably maybe down that path. That's not saying that's definitely where I'm heading, but I'll still be in this area, whether it's over here, whether it's at home, but I think I'd probably stay over here if I can, um, just from the, like, the fact the opportunities and there's so much greater and, yeah, it's a bit more of a high fire nature, like you're in the pros back home or in the AFL or something, but I like it over here. So I see myself probably staying over here in some role. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, Matt, look, I just really want to thank you for your time. Also, on behalf of my company, I want to thank you for your support. You know, it's great to see you sharing my podcast on Twitter, always writing about what I'm doing. You're obviously Australian-born boy. So from, from honestly, from myself and my company, thanks very much. It was great to have you on the show, and um, thanks very much. No problem, mate. Yeah, so as you said, Twitter. So I'm not a Facebook person for communicating yep. all this stuff, but I'm a Twitter yep. guy. So um, at Matt Howley. So if people need to, you want to contact me or stuff like that, probably Twitter is the best place to do it. So that's probably um, the best thing. But yeah, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, re really enjoy what you're doing and think it's great. So just keep progressing along. And I think it's only making the industry that's better. Funny. So once again, guys, if, and this is something we had from Terry. A lot of people wanted to get in contact with Terry. They actually inbox me so the best way to get in contact with you is through twitter twitter um yeah so at matt howley or if they really want to email they could email me at work which if they search they'll be able to find it on our <laughs> university website so i'll leave that to them to find <laughs> if they want to email me but so yeah email me through the university website so first step to doing some us research or at matt howley on twitter is probably the best way to get you heard it first guys um if you really want to go to america search for his details any questions matty other than that, guys, I'll see you guys next podcast. Thanks very much.